So I'm very happy to introduce the speaker for the next um, talk here. Um, it's uh, Pedro. He's a, um, a former PhD at Utrecht uh, University, where he um, actually acquired his PhD on work uh, on um, generic programming. He did quite a few very nice contributions to um, um, academic science um, and stuff. He then moved over to Oxford, where he's currently um, a postdoc at the university. And uh, besides all his um, academic uh, world and uh, work, um, he's also getting uh, in contact with industry. So he has a small company, or is involved with a company called uh, Cordify. And in his talk, he's going to tell us something about how he uses their advanced venture program. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, thanks for pleasure to be here. Um, she said already most uh, of what needs to be done to be said about me. Uh, so I, I'm only going to talk about uh, the stuff I do for Corify in, in this talk. It's a small company. We're five founders. Uh, we co-founded it all together, and uh, have been working on it uh, mostly as a side job for uh, over two years now. Um, so I understand that not everyone here is a Haskell programmer. I'm not sure I understand why, but okay, I take that for granted. Uh, some might even not be a functional programmer, so I'm going to have an introduction to, to Haskell first, because um, I think it's one of the reasons of the, uh, uh, perhaps I didn't say too much, it's one of the reasons of the success uh, of, of Cordify that we used Haskell, but um, I certainly see that it's, it makes a lot of things easier in our lives. So. Um, it's, it's very tied to Cordify, the fact that we use Haskell in the back end. So I want to talk to you about Haskell, um, why we use Haskell, and for that I also have to talk to, a bit to you about uh, what Haskell is and what you can do in Haskell. Um, and there's also, um, so what we do is about chord recognition, recognizing chords for any song. So that involves harmony, so then I have to talk to, to you a bit about harmony. Um, once those things are done, then I can start talking about how to apply uh, model of harmony in practical scenarios. And I'm going to give uh, four or five examples how we can use it for analysis, for finding cover songs, for generating music, uh, for correcting errors, and in particular that's the, the use case for Cordify. So how you can even make a company out of uh, an academic idea. Um, actually I'm going to start with a demo of Cordify because that's always far more interesting. I have a hands-on demo. So this is the website. This is uh, what you get if you go to Cordify.net. Uh, we focus on uh, having these background, kind of background advertisement where the, it tries to still have uh, an advertisement, but that it's not too intrusive, so that you can still enjoy the site and have a even beautiful artwork on the web. Uh, the action occurs here, though, where you can you can upload any file you like, or you can search a song or paste a URL for a SoundCloud or YouTube link. So, for example, you can search for Daft Punk at Lucky. And if you do, and I'm not just going to switch tabs because I want to switch to our development server because there's some new features there. Uh, then you get to a chord page like this, um, where you see the uh, video here on top, and then some controls and the chords that you'll have to play along with the music. Then you can play it, and then, I mean, most of the times we, uh, uh, we use this as an example for guitar players that they can just play along with their guitar. I'm, I'm not a guitar player, I can't play guitar. I'm uh, an organist, so I, I can't bring uh, an organ, like a proper church organ with me, but I can bring a uh, digital keyboard. So I can still show you how you can play along with the song. So you get the point. This thing tells me the chords. This thing on Cordify tells me the chords. And I can just play them along, be it on a keyboard, be it on a guitar, or some people even use it for uh, music production afterwards. So they, for example, you have a choir and you want to uh, make a variant of a song 
in your choir, typically you want to get the chords first because that's what you're going to base yourself in. So, for example, one thing we offer is a download of the song as MIDI or PDF. And uh, this is also uh, one of the monetizing strategies. We sell, sell those for 50 cents a piece. Or there's also premium accounts where you get a number of them included. Uh, not really going to show that. So there's also a couple of features. Uh, you can play back the chords along. Uh, I mean, oh, maybe you can't. Oh yeah, this is a demo server. Shouldn't be. Where is it? Where is it? Uh, okay. You can transpose the chords. It might be useful for you to play the chords in a different key or so. You can change the speed. But the exciting new feature that we're releasing later this month, or um, later this year, is that sometimes the automatic recognition, so this is all done automatically, an algorithm is just getting the, the audio and tracking the chords. But sometimes it makes some mistakes. So you see here, for example, this is an extremely simple song. There's only four chords from the beginning to the end, they're always the same. Um, and here it just kind of missed the, the, the beat. It's at the wrong position. And this chord is just wrong, and this is actually the correct one. So when you spot something like this, we want to allow people to edit the chords so that you can move the chords to the right place as they should be. Or you could even, I mean, if this was some other chord, you could just change it to any other chord that it was. And then, but it isn't. So that minor one. And there you go. Now you have the corrected version. So uh, we're now beta testing this and we're hoping to uh, uh, be able to later collect lots of edits from people and then we can in turn use that to improve our recognition algorithm because we can uh, now feed it with good data for training purposes or something like that. Anyway, this was just a very quick overview of Corify so that you have an idea uh, of what I'm going to talk about. Now, First, a quick introduction to harmony. Um, when, you, when people think of music, the, the most noticeable elements are normally melody, rhythm, um, the instruments being used, etc. But harmony is, is an extremely important uh, element of music, probably as important as melody. It's just not as prominent. It's in the background, typically, and it's something that you can't, you can't sing along to the harmony, uh, because it's about the notes that happen at the same time. Uh, whereas melody is like the horizontal component of music, you have notes one after the other. In, in harmony, you're looking at the notes that are being played at the same time. And um, it's rather important because it's what makes music have uh, patterns and tension and release. So, I can give an example by playing this progression you see here. This is a... progression of six, six chords. Now, if you try leaving out one of these chords, it depends very much which one you leave out. If I take this one, this one is just falling into this one, it's a secondary dominant of that one, then nothing changes much, really. However, if I decide to leave out the last one, that's the tonic, the most important uh, one, in a way, and it's kind of what the whole song is built around, then you get something different because then you know there's something missing. You get uh, then what is called a suspended uh, cadence that it doesn't really resolve; it stays um, waiting for a resolution that may not come, but that can give, for example, suspense in a movie or something like that. So harmony is a uh, this underlying aspect of music that it's sometimes hard to explain to, to, to people when they're not musically trained, but it's there and it follows very strict rules generally. So uh, you can't just have any sequence of chords because they just don't sound right. Um, melodies also follow rules and you can't just have any sequence of notes and that's not going to sound nice as a melody. But uh, with harmony, these rules are stricter and they've been, um, they've been in place for hundreds of years in classical music. So it's a, it's a very nice thing to study and to model in particular. Um, 
So the, the kind of things I'm, I'm looking at is how to express these sequences of chords in a tree-based fashion that shows, that makes the hierarchy explicit between these chords. In this sequence, um, there's the C chord at the beginning and, and at the end, and that's the tonic. And in the middle there's a dominant. The dominant falls into the tonic. The tonic is like the ground where you normally begin and end at, and the dominant is what leads to the tonic. And there's all the tension is generally around these two. And then there's lots of other things that are sub-structures of, the, of these two. So, in the dominant we see that we group the, the three middle chords. And in particular, this one here, we can see that the D7 is a dominant of the G7 itself. So it's a secondary dominant. The D7 leads into G7, and the G7, but in its turn, leads to C. So, this is the kind of structure that is hidden in this sequence and that I want to model formally. And now, why would I want to do that? Because once we have this model of harmony, we know which chords fit in a sequence and which chords do not. And now we can use that for uh, several things. For example, if you have um, two songs and you want to, or actually if you have just one song and you know it's on one structure, then you can find other songs and search not by melody, not by uh, length, duration, <coughs> duration, but search by similarity in harmony. And that will give you harmonically similar songs, which you will often find are cover songs. Because cover songs change uh, the tempo, the instruments, even the melody sometimes. But the harmony stays mostly untouched because that's very much part of the identity of a, of a song. You can use it to improve audio and score recognition. So when you're trying to convert from an MP3 to text or a digitalized uh, score into a textual representation, you're going to get errors in the recognition. And sometimes you aren't sure if at a specific point a certain chord that you recognize is a C or a G, for example. And if you look at the model of harmony, it will tell you what is more likely to be there. And often you can find that uh, one is very likely and the other one is completely unlikely, so that you can just pick that and be pretty sure that that was the chord that was in your original source. And you can even use it for generation, because once you have a model, you can just generate data that fits into this model. So I'm going to touch briefly upon each of these. But first, a quick introduction to Haskell. So uh, can I just have a quick show of hands who here has programmed in Haskell? OK. Um, it's, uh, it's very easy to understand Haskell. The notation is very natural, I think. So. Um, any any type of code I show you will just immediately understand this, so I'm not particularly worried about this. Anyway, um, strongly typed, pure, and functional. By strongly typed, we mean that um, all values in the language have uh, an associated type, and these are known statically. So you don't have to run a program to know the types of your expressions. You know them already when you compile them. This gives you strong guarantees that certain things will not occur at runtime. You will not have uh, a place where you expect an integer and you get a string at runtime because the type checker has already caught those errors for you. Um, in particular, I use this to ensure the safety in my model of harmony. Um, I have a model of harmony that ensures that only the correct chords can fit in that harmony. And I have a type checker checking that for me. I'll show that later. Purity means that uh, General expressions in Haskell do not have side effects. So if you call a function with an argument once, and then you call that same function with that same argument sometime later, you actually don't need to call it. You can just use the value, the return value that you got before, because the function can't do anything other than produce that value. It cannot write a file or something like that. So Haskell functions are more like mathematical functions in that they're pure. And um, the functional style means that your program is generally not a sequence of statements, but it's instead a composition of functions. You write functions, they take inputs and produce outputs, and then you combine these into compositional blocks of a function. Uh, so I'm going to show you briefly how you could represent music in Haskell, um, now more the melodic case just for an example. So I'm going to simplify a lot 
here, musically speaking, for presentation purposes. So let's say we have eight, uh, seven notes. A through G, so that's, if I start with C, that's the, the seven basic notes. Um, that's just the root of the note, because I can play a C that's different octave, so that's like a different uh, height, so it can be this C, or this, or this. So, to get the, an extra note on a keyboard, we need more than just the root, we also need to know at what octave is played. Okay, then roots, for, for encoding roots, we just define a data type that has uh, seven possible alternatives, named A through G. These are then constructors of the data type roots. I always have types in red and the constructors, so the values used to build something of a type in blue. Um, here we have a type synonym for octaves. We're not going to define a data type, we just use integers, if they are already defined. Uh, so, these are standard names. This would be a, uh, a fourth octave, this at the fifth. And then a node is just uh, is built with a constructor called node. You can have constructors sharing a name or a type. And it takes two arguments. It's uh, the root of the node and at what octave it is played. By the way, feel free to interrupt me at any time with any question. Um, okay, now we have uh, a way to represent nodes. Let's encode all the nodes in the fourth octave. We define values A4 to G4. We say that their type is node. And uh, an A4 is just a node A for the integer 4. <coughs> the 4 should kind of be in blue if you're thinking of it being a value as well. But we we'll start getting too blue at some point. So these are the uh, these nodes. Now what can we do with these notes? A melody is a sequence of notes. For sequences we're going to use Haskell's lists, which are uh, ubiquitous in Haskell and used all the time. So we say that a melody is a list of notes, and now we can define melodies by just putting these brackets around it, that's the syntax for lists, and the elements on it. A scale is a sequence of notes, in particular the C major scale is the one that starts on C and ends in B, or actually normally that is in D, C, just an octave above, but I'm going to skip that because it's kind of a repetition. So now we have a melody, very simple one, but it's just by putting notes into a list. Um, now let's say I want to reverse this melody, so I want to play this melody backwards. In Haskell this is very simple, I can just call the function reverse, which reverse, reverses a list. So the C major scale reversed is the function reverse applied to the C major scale. Now what is reverse? Well, reverse is a function that comes with a standard prelude. You don't have to define it yourself. I'm showing you the definition. Um, the interesting thing of reverse is that it, it works on lists of any type. I am using it with lists of nodes, but you can also use it on lists of integers. You can use it on, on strings, which are lists of characters, and polymorphic. So, it takes a list of alpha for any alpha and returns a list of alphas. If it's the empty list, well, it returns the empty list. The list is reverse already. If we've got an element at the head of the list and the rest of the list, the tail, and we reverse it by putting the head at the end, so a list with a single element, which is then concatenated with reversing the tail. This plus plus is again something that comes predefined. It just takes two lists and concatenate or append them one to the other. It doesn't matter too much uh, to understand what's going on, it's just that I'm using standard functions to operate on things that have a musical meaning at no extra cost. Um, transposition means taking something that is played at one octave and moving it one octave higher or lower, so I can take this chord and transpose it one octave higher by just playing all its notes uh, one octave higher. You can do the same for a melody, you just transpose each of the notes of the melody one octave higher. So how do we do that? We do this in, in, uh, in small pieces. So first, uh, how do we transpose an octave itself? Well, that's an integer, so we just add one to that integer. If we have a note, um, we transpose it an octave up by leaving the root unchanged, because we don't want to change that, we just want to change its octave, so we use the function we defined above. Now, a melody, 
we just want to take each of the nodes and put them one octave higher. So for that we use uh, uh, another built-in function, map, just that takes a list and a function to apply to each of the elements on the list. That's, oh, that's another really fine function for which I don't have to, but it works on lists of any type, and, uh, on functions of any type. It takes a list of A's and a function that transforms A's into B's and returns a list of B's. In this case, my A's and B's are the same. I'm just taking a list of notes and returning back a list of notes. Um, other things you can do, uh, Haskell is a lazy language, so values are only evaluated when there is a demand for it, there's a, there's a need to evaluate something. So you can have infinite values. And ostinato is a rep repeated melody with no end. And here we, can, we do that by, by just taking a melody and then concatenating it to an ostinato on that melody. So if you expand ostinato m to be m plus plus, you're just going to get an infinite sequence of n plus plus n plus plus n. Um, which then, I mean, at some later point, you're probably going to take the first 100 or the first 1,000 nodes of this melody, and then all is fine. If you try to just evaluate this directly, then, well, the compiler starts, it's going to start giving you this infinite melody. Um, can we, now we can do analysis of melodies. For example, we can check if a given melody is in C major. We said our melody is in C major if uh, the notes in this melody are, if all of the notes are elements of a C major scale. How do we do that? Well, we do a composition of functions. First, we just extract the root note of all the melodies so we forget about the octaves. And then we check if all of the melodies in this, all, all of the notes in this list are elements of the C major scale. Again, just an example of how you can use these pre-built functions or these built-in functions and give it something of a musical meaning quite easily in Haskell. So I left out a lot of details. Uh, in particular, my melodies all are in C major because are, I only gave you notes from the C major scale. But there's <coughs> nothing of a musical working on how to do serious uh, musical representation in Haskell. There are some references here. The slides will be online. So what I do, however, is uh, based on harmony. So I'm not generally looking at individual notes, or I'm not even looking at notes at all, just their combinations. And I abstract away from specific chords because uh, I don't care so much if it's a C or a D, I care if it's the first or the second in the, in the scale that we're working on. So it's at a slightly higher level of abstraction. So the kind of things I want to, to get is to take a melody like this and generate a tree that represents the harmony. This was the first thing that we worked on uh, myself, together with a, another PhD student at the time from Utrecht University. We um, wrote the model of musical harmony in Haskell, and then wrote the parser that just takes textual sequences of chords and gives you back the tree structure of this sequence. One important thing that we improved, so this student had been working on this for a while. He, uh, he was using grammars for parsing music, but he was using a Java generated grammar, which uh, did rather poorly in general, especially when the sequence wouldn't match the grammar for some reason, then it would just say it failed to parse. When we did this in Haskell, we used the um, error correcting parsers of Deutsches Wierster, a professor back then at Utrecht University. So you can see here, um, you, you, we see the, the, the chords that we parsed there at the leaves of this structure. But here, there's an ins this stands for insertion. So there was no chord here between the C7 and the G minor, but the harmony model feels that there should be a chord there, else this melody doesn't really fit the rules of harmony as we, as we programmed them in the model. So instead of failing and just saying parse error, it tries to go on and tries to do something sensible that makes the rest of the sequence still make sense. And musically, this is rather interesting. So what's going on here is just that this G minor C7 is just repeated and then resolves to the F major. Uh, and our model wasn't expecting that you could repeat these sequences, so it expected the resolution to be here. It's as simple as that. So when we, when we see one of these errors, we can decide oh, we have to improve our model, or we can conclude that the sequence, for some reason, was just not uh, harmonically very correct or something like that. But in any case, it just it doesn't fail. It still gives you some output. 
and we can analyze this output. We can just parse a sequence and see how many errors it has. If it has one or two errors in 100 or 200 cores, that's fine. Um, if 50% of it are corrections or are deletions or insertions, then something clearly went wrong there. Um, all right, now similarity, uh, also just very briefly. We uh, had a student, um, uh, no, a student in Utrecht worked on comparing trees for their difference. The diff algorithm is generally used in text, so if you use git or something like that and you have a commit, it finds the difference between what you now have and what you have, and performs a textual diff. So it analyzes the characters as they change, or the lines. Um, but you can generalize this and perform diffs on any structures. You can perform diffs on lists of characters, but you can perform also diffs on trees, binary trees, um, leaf trees, whatever you want. So there was a student who implemented a generic diff that works for any data structure. And then we kind of just use that to our model of harmony to compute the differences between these two of these, these kind of trees. Um, and get some sort of uh, edit distance result that says I can transform the first into the second. So this gives a, a measure of the distance between the harmonies of two songs, and we then in turn use this to look up cover songs in a database. So you take 5,000 songs, and then you pick one, and you try it over the other 5,000 to find out which ones are the most similar, harmonically. And once you do this harmonically, you will find that this is a good strategy for finding cover songs. So there's also a paper about that, and it, it was nice to see that we could just take a generic tool that was not specialized to working in music at all, and you know just use it. There's no changes necessary whatsoever. We have our model, we have a generic function, we bring these together, and it just works. You can do a better job if you don't use a generic tool, and if you actually build a diff that takes uh, all the musical uh, knowledge you have into account. But this comes for free, so it's really cool to see that you have basically an easy prototype to work on. Generation. Um, so the, there were two separate things done here. We had a student that for his bachelor thesis took the task of once you're given the melody, the upper part, if you want to come up with a sequence of chords that uh, matches pleasantly, so that, plays, that you can play along with this melody. The, the way he did this, was to take our harmony model, generate, uh, no, it was actually to generate uh, all possible chords that could potentially fit with this melody, and then just naively parse all of these sequences with our harmony model, and then select the one that had the least errors. Very naive, very simple, but hey, it was a bachelor thesis, so simple project. Then it came up with uh, decent results. I can't easily play this on this small keyboard, but um, there are just some, like, some, like, some examples online, and they sound pretty reasonable. Um, another different thing that I looked at is just to generate harmony from, from scratch, without anything. Because once you see a tree like this, I've been telling you that these trees are built by, we have these chords, then we uh, make them just relative to their key, and then we find out the, the structure of the relationship between them. But you can also look at it the other way around. You can just say, oh, I have a model, so how do I build a piece? Well, a piece is a phrase, and a phrase could, for example, be a tonic, dominant, tonic. A dominant could be, for example, subdominant, dominant. So you can, you can take a model from the top down, and then you're just generating sequences of chords, which, because they come from your model, which you know will um, be musically valid in some sense. So uh, I want to show you a, a very, I mean, I've been talking about the model, model, but I haven't even shown you the model. So I'm going to show you a very simple, uh, simplified version of a model. First in a um, grammar-like, um, context-free grammar style, but parameterized. So you're going to have productions on the left that expand to the right, but there are these variables. Well, there's only this one. Um, in music, you can have major and minor mode. And there are different rules of harmony for these two modes. Many of them are the same, though. But some of them are only good for minor, some of them are only good for major. So we use a variable to, in the general case, try to avoid uh, being specific, but sometimes we have to say this is only for minor, this is only for major. Okay, so a piece is a sequence of phrases, that's fine. A phrase could either start in the tonic and then evolve to dominant and then go back to the tonic, 
or it could just begin straight away with the dominant and then with the tonic. The tonic, we're only going to consider two cases, the major case, so that's this chord, or the minor case, which is this chord. And again, I'm calling it one, so this could actually be any chord. Um, you, you can treat music relatively, and then you specify a given key, and that kind of tells you where to start on the, on the, on the possible ones of the keyboard. Dominance, um, it could just be the dominant chord, this one here. Or it could be an expansion, so, so like the subdominant that prepared the dominant first. Or it could be this uh, secondary dominant that we've seen before, the second degree, going to the fifth. Subdominant, well, there's a couple of possible expansions there, some for major and some for minor. It doesn't really matter. So it's just a it's very simple uh, model, an uh, example model, um, that, that, will, that will also see that it's easy to extend. So how do we convert this into Haskell? Well, it's very easy. Uh, because basically when you define a data type with its constructors, it's like having one of these production rules and each of the alternatives is going to become a constructor. So we said that a piece was a list of phrases and the phrase had two possibilities. It could be tonic, dominant, tonic or just dominant, tonic. So here I'm defining a data type by introducing two constructors and I make this is a slightly different syntax from before. It gives the constructor name and its type. So it takes three arguments and it builds something of type of phrase. Tonics, we had two tonics, the uh, major and the minor one. There were a couple of dominants, etc. Um, this, this kind of works, but it's not what I want because this is not type safe enough. So you can see now that there's nothing preventing me from putting whatever degree I want in the major or minor case. Each of them builds a tonic, and these tonics are indistinguishable from the outside. So there's nothing preventing me from putting a minor chord in the major phase, for example. The only thing that says it's minor is the name, but obviously the compiler is not checking that the name makes sense, right? So then uh, I forgot to show you the degrees. They're just these. Uh, it's the same as A to G before, but now made relatives so one to seven. So how can we enforce this uh, this constraint? Well, we can parameterize our model by, by um, the mode, for example. And now we can say, for piece, nothing changes, but for the tonic case, we can see that now the tonic major case only builds tonic in the major mode, whereas the minor case only builds them in the minor mode. And additionally, I can also have an encoding of degrees that says that this is actually the degree on the first, uh, with the first root note and in major mode whereas this one is in minor mode. So we can use um, the type level information to, uh, to put in our model the, to restrict the kind of chords that we can build. And now we have a model that can only build harmonically correct valid sequences. Um, so this is, this is then the encoding of degrees and their possible qualities. They're just not major and minor. There's a few more, but it doesn't matter. And then you see that in the uh, the data type that goes to degrees, you are uh, indexing it over the, the degree and its quality. So then you are guaranteed to only have a first major in that, at the position of a tonic. Um, okay. Now, how do we generate actually these sequences now that we have this data type? Well, again, we just make use of a standard tool in functional programming, quick check, which is generally used to uh, generate test data for for your testing functions. Well, we can just use it to generate music now because my data type encodes music, so if I generate values of this data type, it generates an harmony sequence. Um, and furthermore, because my data type actually has dozens, dozens of data types with lots of constructors, I don't want to write all this generating code by hand. And this code really only depends on the structure of the data type, so all the information is there already. So you can just use generic programming, and I can define one single function Gen, which gives me a Gen A, which basically means it's something in the quick check world, and I can just use to generate data. Some details here, but it doesn't matter. All my model is representable, so I can get all this free. Even more, I can make this function not too general and say, but I want it to say that certain constructors have higher weights or lower weights. So you can take a generic function and make it more specific by taking extra information with it. Now some examples. 
this is mostly boilerplate code log queries that I'm calling gen, and I'm telling it, I could just pass it without argument, but I'm telling it, I want these two rules to have slightly higher, um, um, higher probability of showing up. And then uh, I just call my example, and it just provides me a list of generated harmonies, just using break gen. I'm uh, running out of time, but I still want to go back to Codify and just explain the problem there. So there you are recognizing ports from um, an audio source. So you have, at some point, you're going to have different candidates for each beat. And this is like their, uh, how much, what's it called, the, the weight, the confidence in that this is the chord there. So the highest confidence is on a G, but it could be a G minor as well. So we use our model to try to find, so we don't just pick the highest confidence one, we look at the others and we see which one actually fits best into the model. And when you have things like G and G minor, uh, harmonically speaking, it's very unlikely that you will be having trouble to decide about these two. When one is valid and the other one is almost always invalid. So it, it can really gives us uh, big gains into improving the recognition. Um, so the front end is slightly boring. It's uh, PHP, JavaScript, etc. It's what renders the website to the users. Um, but the backend is where the interesting stuff happens. So we get the audio as input and we just give the chords back as textual for the front end to render. We're using all sorts of advanced functional programming techniques there, like some stuff I've shown you, like JDTs, but also type families and generic programming. It's open source and it's available on Hackage, a code repository of uh, Haskell programs. It also does the PD app and the export. Our statistics, we've been online for a little over two years now. Uh, these are our top countries, US, UK, Germany, Indonesia, Canada. Germany is a tricky country, actually, when I was looking up for an example to play along here. So many videos are blocked on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have like these lists of uh, beta featured songs, um, but yeah, more than half of them are just more work in Germany. So. Um, about 3 million views every month. 1.8 million songs, uh, quickly approaching 2 million in the database, and uh, over 200,000 registered users. That doesn't necessarily mean paying users, just people who made an account so they can keep track of their songs, etc. So, uh, so this is quite good, it grew faster than we expected, and uh, we're very happy. It's been that we can take our, what was initially just academic research, and bring it to such a wide audience, and people seem to like it and enjoy it. Um, Pretty easy to run. We just have one single VPS. No need for multiple servers. It hosts both the uh, the web and database servers. Uh, no problem there. Uh, the interaction between the backend and the front end is also very simple. The backend just generates a text file. The front end just reads it. The backend is open source and GPL v3, so actually the front end can't link to the backend because the front end isn't open source. So all I can do is actually call it as an executable and read its output anyway. But this is not a source of problem or inefficiency. Um, so we're five people. We started this as our own side job and it was uh, lots of fun and uh, just programming and hacking away. But quickly things grow when you end up um, finding yourself doing taxation or finding VAT regulations in Europe or outside Europe, uh, doing user support, etc. But it's fun, and I would definitely recommend everyone in academia to try to find something that they can apply outside academia and, and come up with a, with a way to do so. Um, so that's basically what I wanted to tell you about. I gave you a, a review of how you can model music in Haskell and lots of things you can do with it, including your company and making some money. Thank you. Examples now on YouTube of people that are trying to make extremely bad music in order to hack your website. <laughs> no, um, it, it's, you don't hack the website by just feeding it uh, some weird music. Uh, lots of people, the first thing they try is black metal or, uh, or something which has no harmony content in it. <laughs> but you can also just try something extremely hard like Chopin or so. Uh, it will fail miserably, right? It's, 
it works really good. So you saw the get left course, those were just, it's exactly what it's recognized. I didn't, I didn't correct them manually beforehand. And most songs out there, most songs people are playing, are of that complexity. So it just works fine for most of our users. Does it also work for classical music? Um, so, well, sure, why not? <laughs> but if, if you go back like to the Baroque style, and if you do have a, a clearly noticeable beat, which you almost never have, uh, and then it does. So the problem is that now we use the beat very strongly to try to uh, match the chords to beat changes. And this is not so easy to, to, to track in classical music. But if you take uh, Baroque harmony, at least, yeah, it performs reasonably well. Can you use this to predict the next big hit? Um, no. It's not really harmony based. It's more about what clothes they will or will not wear in the video. <laughs> <laughs> so. Can you give an example of some really complex harmonic transitions that you have actually been able to analyze? That we are not able to? Uh, that you are able to. I mean, uh, uh, you so, uh, showed some trivial examples, but, but what are the most advanced ones? Well, we, we model secondary chains of dominance, both chromatic and diatonic, tritone substitutions. So, in one of the original papers, we were modeling jazz harmony. So, yeah, the, the model is, pre is pretty powerful. It's just, it becomes sometimes tricky to encode these things at the type level, because we have to explain the relationships between these degrees at the type level. But Haskell has very good features with this at the moment, so it's just, it's just good. So, uh, but I would these, say try to substitutions and these secondary dominances, but I haven't shown them. Right, but, but they are visible uh, at the website? Uh, yes, yeah, if you go to my website, uh, you, you can look at the publications. So, that's right in the computer music journal that describes the complete model. Questions? Then let's thank the speaker again.